Let's get this out of the way right up front. I am not here to debate about drum samples. Look, a lot of records use drum samples. Probably most of them use drum samples. So you just have to deal with it. And personally, I'm not that interested in talking about these pie in the sky ideals. I like talking about what's practical, like how to actually make good sounding records. Now here are the facts. Sometimes you do get an amazing drummer with an amazing arrangement, an amazing drum kit, and a great room, and a great recording, and all the stars align, and you don't have to use any drum samples, and it sounds great. That's awesome, I love when that happens. But the other 95% of the time, you just have to use the tools available to get the result that you need to get. Put it this way, if you were hired by a band or a label to deliver a professional quality finished product that they could tour on and market and push and sell, but the drums suck, and you hand over the record and you say, yeah, I know the drums sound kind of lame, but you know what, I, I have a thing against drum samples, so, you know, sorry, that's, that's just how it is. Yeah, good luck to your career on audio. Complaining and being all high and mighty about drum samples is kind of like if you were to say that a carpenter is not a real carpenter and they're a phony because they're using power drills and, and electric saws instead of using the old school vintage hand saws and that's not allowed. Now with all that said, I do understand some of the perspective and some of the complaints about the way that some engineers and mixers do use drum samples. In fact, I made a whole video rant where I was kind of complaining about this. You can check that out here, but I get it. It can be a crutch. And if you know me at all, you know my mission is to create real engineers, like engineers who can record a drum kit, can tune a drum kit, can mix real drums and don't necessarily have to rely on samples out of just a, a complete lack of knowledge of how to mix a real drum kit. You should be able to adapt to a variety of different genres and situations to be able to get the best tone and the best performance and the best end result in a whole slew of different situations. So I'm not here in this video advocating that you go and build your audio career off of using cool drum samples. You know, it's just a tool in the toolbox and that's what I wanna talk about today and kind of show you kind of the wrong way and the bad way that a lot of people are using it right now. So the problem to focus on is not whether drum samples are you know, legit or not, or whether you're a real mixer if you use drum samples, or whether you're, anyone should listen to your record if you use drum samples on it. That's not the problem. The problem is the poor use of drum samples, and I'm finding this is really rampant across even some, some pretty big releases today. We're all familiar with that machine gun sound, which is just the lazy use of samples when you don't, you know, you're just putting a one shot over a bunch of fast snare hits and it just sounds ridiculous. Nobody likes that. But going further than that, what I'm hearing more often now is just a, what sounds like a completely inappropriate choice of drum samples for different songs. The number one rule as a mixer and as an engineer or producer is to serve the song, do what makes the song sound best and come alive and have the most energy and connect the most with listeners. But unfortunately, what I'm hearing on a lot of mixes today is these crazy overblown sounds where it actually kind of sounds like the mixer is more concerned with having the most outrageous, crazy, biggest kick and snare sound more than they're concerned with actually serving the song and making a good sounding record that's fun to listen to. It's like they're trying to impress all their engineer friends instead of trying to make a record that people like. And this poor choice and poor use of, of drum samples is distracting and actually puts a barrier between the listener and the song. It keeps them from connecting at the right level because it's distracting. It's if, if your listener is thinking about the snare sound or the kick sound, instead of listening to the lyrics, listening to the song, then you've probably gone off track as a mixer. And plus, you can use drum samples and still have your drums sound like a real drum kit. Just because you use drum samples doesn't mean that you're making your drums sound like a sledgehammer and a gunshot every time there's a kick and snare. So I totally use drum samples. Sometimes it's just a little bit tucked in, which I'm gonna show you. Sometimes I have to end up replacing the whole thing, but I still try to chew samples and mix them in a way that it still sounds like drums. So let me just show you in some real sessions here, some examples of how not to use drum samples. Here's a mix for a Nick Johnston song. All right, sounds pretty good. Sounds modern, punchy, but still pretty natural. Now let's bring up kick and snare trigger tracks here. Now I'm gonna show you an example of the kind of records that uh, I'm hearing uh, lately, the kind of mixes, even on genres like this, or maybe pop rock or pop punk, where you know, you're know you not really calling for that crazy overblown sound, yet people are still using these kind of samples. So here's, um, 
this is actually just one of my kick samples, but it's a pretty aggressive one that I would use for metal. And then I just found this snare sample that kind of sounds like a lot of records I hear today. Again, even pop and pop rock records that have this kind of cannon shot snare sound. Now listen to this. Now, yeah, the snare sounds massive, but does that suit the song? Is that an appropriate choice? What if we used uh, one of the crazier kick samples that I have here? I mean, it sounds completely ridiculous, but I've heard drum mixes like this on albums that kind of are in this genre, and they're just using these insanely overblown drum samples. And to me, it's just, that's not fun to listen to. I mean, maybe the first couple times you kind of get into the song, but you're not going to want to keep coming back and listening to a record that sounds like this. <laughs> Let me switch to a different example and show you even how this can be a problem in heavier music too. So here's an intervals mix session here. Here's what the actual mix sounds like. I mean, there's tons of cool dynamics and ghost notes and everything in the kick and snare. And my mission here was to try and maintain that as much as possible and keep it sounding like a natural kit yet still be punchy and big and exciting. Now, however, this is how I'm hearing a lot of people mix these days. Again, let's go to some of these crazy overblown sounds. All of a sudden it just sounds so sterile and just I don't know, just not unique at all. And especially when we get into faster sections. Now, if we go back after listening to that, I think this is why some mixers, you know, get a little insecure. They compare their mix to let's maybe some references and records that do sound like that. And then they actually, you know, hear some normal sounding drum tracks that are like this. Again, this is my final mix. And they're like, Oh my goodness, my snare and my kick are, are not massive like that other one. And then so they end up just being like, well, I guess, I guess I've got to do that. Um, but you don't have to. You can still have a competitive sounding record without using those crazy overblown sounds. So look, I know I might be exaggerating a tiny bit here, but not by much. And the point I want to make is that you can really ruin a mix and even maybe have a mix that sounds cool for like the first 20 seconds, but then it's not fun to listen to a whole song or a whole album. When I'm using drum samples, my, my goal, I'm not saying that always works out depending on the source material I get, but my goal is to use samples in a way that the live track and the sample, they interact and they both need each other. So in other words, if I muted the kick sample, the kick is not going to quite sound powerful enough, but if I muted the live kick, then the sample on its own is also not carrying all the weight. It's not going to sound good enough. And I can show you a couple examples, even uh, in this interval session here. So we have the live kick. And then my sample obviously adds a lot of uh, presence and cut. But listen, if we mute the sample,
Yeah, it doesn't quite cut enough, but if we mute the live kick, it doesn't have enough body. That also doesn't cut enough, but together, it works together great. It's, it's that kind of symbiotic relationship where the sum is, is greater than the parts. And it's very similar with the snare here. So if we take uh, this drum mix here and we mute the snare sample, It's a nice live snare sound, but it could be a little brighter and have a little bit more punch. So then we add in my sample. But if we mute the live snare, it's not like I have so much sample in the mix that the, it can stand on its own. It can't, it has to work with the live snare. just adds that little extra weight and crack that was missing. And in this Nick Johnson mix, it's the same with the kick. Actually, it's mostly real kick in the mix here. This kick sample is it's pretty subtle. It's just adding a little bit more kind of weight and uh, honestly, like on purposely adding some of those more muddy frequencies uh, to fill out and round out the kick. So those are some examples for you. And look, if you feel like you're guilty of doing this the wrong way, it's okay. There's forgiveness for you. I think a lot of us are guilty of this going through that stage where we start to learn all these tools and get our hands on all these sound, sounds and samples and we go overboard. I certainly can listen to records in the past that I've done and I'm like, man, I just, I went too far with, with that editing or that polishing or with these drum sounds or whatever. Um, so it happens. It's okay. You know, just keep learning and keep pressing on, but make sure that you keep the, the end goal in mind and really just focus on the main point, which is mixing the song so that it has energy. It's a sounds the best version that that song could be. And then it connects with the listener and make sure that your mix is enhancing that connection and not distracting the listener. And I know we have this, this really tight bubble, this community of audio engineers, especially heavy audio engineers, and we're all chasing that big giant drum sound. And you know, that's okay, that's cool. But remember 99% of the fans of music who are listening to the records you're working on, they're not in this bubble, okay? They're not in this mindset of competing to see who has the hugest, craziest snare sound. They just wanna listen to good songs. So remember who you're mixing for. So I'm looking forward to all of the angry comments that are going to be posted below for people who didn't watch beyond 30 seconds in this video and uh, tell me how drum samples ruined music. I look forward to reading those. But for those of you who are actually watching this and who actually make records in real life for real bands, I hope that this gave you a little uh, perspective and a little more, more motivation to make sure that you keep creating interesting, dynamic, unique, and creative mixes. And by the way, speaking of drum samples that really just mix in well underneath a live snare, I've got a secret weapon single shot brass snare sample that uh, you might want to try out in your mixes. It's totally free. If you click the next video here popping up, there's a link in that video where you can go and download my single shot snare sample. All right. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later.